Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in TNO, the last of Europe, in which we're playing with the TNO 1.4.0 Silicon Dreams, in which we're playing as everyone's favorite Guangdong State, the state of Guangdong. We're led by Suzuki Taichi, uh, and uh, we got Undance Makab. Bang! The son of the gavel stood Kanda Tatsuya. 53 years old, Chief Marketing Officer of Yamashiro Chemicals uh, Limited, Hong Kong. With his usual booming yet soothing voice, he delivered the contents of the stack of paper in his hand unto the rest of the complex. He talked of skyrocketing numbers and of shining furnaces of today lining the Kowloon Riverside, and the surely indispensable patronage of Morita Akio that brought them back teeming with life. Teeming with life indeed, he smiled, his mind back to yesterday's creative shipments landing at his doorsteps. Bang! Up stood Inaba Yukio, 46 years old, Vice President of Collective Tomorrow Enterprises. He smirked and applauded the marvelous stunt by the infamous Sony Yes Man speaking before him. He then preached of derelict storefronts littering Hong Kong's uh, outskirts, of the hazards of Guangdong's over reliance on industries of little concern. His voice was calm, monotone, yet with every passing minute, another dagger pierced the veil. He was fighting the good fight, of course he was. Secure on one more plot of land in Kowloon for Fujitsu, and yet there's a way left towards promotion. <coughs> Bang! Kawasaki, or Kawasaki, uh, Kawasaki uh, Kaichi, 61 years old, represented the director of Akagi Finance. I uh, sat on moving, his corpulent, stony complexion barely betraying the grin blossoming underneath. It was he who brought her the slip of the land in the legislative council in the first place. His contacts and Matsushita had instructed him so. Let the two little rivals shout each other into a gridlock, and then he and his friends shall move in and take the spoils. Nobody would know, not today. Bang, bang, bang. The 100 suits, black and white and ro blue, rose to their feet in a perfect unison. With this, we fulfill our service to the great executive, chief executive, to the state of Guangdong, and may our prosperity reign for a thousand years more. They chanted. Then came the scattering tango of heels on the marble floor, and then another day of good cooperation was thus called. And then the great chief executive shall do well to serve them. Dance with my little hand in yours, dance until dawn, uh, dawn breaks, with day off. Basilicon dreams on the Pearl River. Guangdong is a world of dreams, caught between three re realities. For the Chinese living in the countryside and cities, their dreams have or will be broken as they toil in mines and factories, uh, are evicted from their land, and face abject poverty on all sides. For the Japanese elites, their dreams are coming to fruition. The state serves them in their every whim, swayed by the words and orders. They live in opulence, sustained by the suffering or in lighter terms, hard work of everyone below. And the Cantonese Japanese are caught in the middle of the contradiction, a mix of the local population and the Japanese. They're the middle class, an ideal that the Chinese strive for as they strive to achieve the lifestyle of the elite. <coughs> Despite these conditions, thousands of migrants come to Guangdong searching for a place to fulfill their wildest dreams. Chief Executive Suzuki is but one of them. There's a long road ahead of him and innumerable obstacles along the way, but the path is paved and Suzuki intends to walk it. Day off. In a company dorm somewhere in Guangdong, a shift of Chinese workers enjoyed a merciful day off of work. And a miraculous development, the machines over, which the workers were forced to slave for hours each day, had broken down and were out of the commission for the day. The workers split into two teams and kicked a makeshift ball around the courtyard. Many Westerners might recognize what they were playing as a version of football, but it was known to them by the Japanese name of Shu Shukyu. Out of the game ended, one team drubbed the other 5-1. to one. They broke up into the various cliques and sat down on various aluminum stairs that led to the courtyard. While there, the discussions went along the usual lines of families they left behind, or in some hapless case, been forced to be separated from. Many of them wanted to head out to see a movie, but none of them had passes they might need to leave the dormitories, and it wasn't technically a scheduled day off. Even if they did, the guards wouldn't let them leave, not until they demonstrated proof of renting a place elsewhere. And what the heck would it happen? And when the heck would that would happen? The workers can contemplate the situation. Life in Guangdong was unquestionably a veil of tears, filled with mourning and weeping, although, of course, the workers would far, be far more coarser about it if one asked them. But it could be worse, they knew well. They could be in China, where their compatriots were all poor, miserable, and utterly bereft of hope. At least here in Guangdong, the workers could dare to dream about what might be beyond the gates, unlike in China, where the atmosphere was misery, misery, and misery for miles around. They held on to that shirt of hope. It was all they had. 1962 meetings. Tokyo meetings. A new year, another meeting. The time has come to meet the Japanese government once again and to deliver a report on the state of Guangdong's economy. Prime Minister Ino has set high expectations out for all of us, and to that we fulfill to the best of our abilities. Whether or not he and the rest of his government will prove is an entirely different matter, but no one knows the future, least of all us. Unlocks the three evils of Guangdong GY in the decisions tab. Cops at work. In the small garden atmosphere of an industrial district in Hong Kong, <clears throat> once known as Hong Kong to the British colonizers that preceded the current colonial regime, a Guangdong police officer stopped someone that was suspected of shoplifting, or so he said. Everyone and their mother-in-law knew that shoplifting cases didn't occur remotely as often as the diligent police officers claimed they were. No, even a child could tell you that this was just an unsettled attempt to shake everyone down for a bribe. The young Chinese boy that the officer chose to pick on protested violently, but the officer himself, a Zhu Jin, 
uh, threaten him in Cantonese to call on his Japanese superior. The boy would have resisted had he not seen a Kenpai Tai car riding in the corner. The boy cursed violently and paid the bribe, which amounted to his wages for the day. At that, the officer, satisfied, let him go. The boy continued swearing under his breath as the reality of another night without food sunk in. <clears throat> The officer, on the other hand, began to rationalize his actions, as he always did when he did something like this. He wasn't paid enough, he said, that's why he did it. He had to provide for his family, even if that meant the others had to fit the bill. Law of the jungle, or whatever it was that the scientist Carl Sidney had said, the strong take from the weak. But his conscience kept on tormenting him. Overlooking the Pearl River, the regions of the Guangdong, GUI. So, a faint ray of sunlight broke through the gray smog wafting over uh, the factories of the Pearl River casting a, sh natural, a shaft of natural light into the Suzuki T Taichi's office. The chief executive, welcoming the distraction, followed the beam to the office floors to ceiling windows, surveying the city of Koshu, formerly Guangzhou, as he lit a third cigarette that morning. The team Jap Chinese masses rushing through the cityscape canyons while ignoring the signals of the Guangdong police their clamor kept distant by Kenpai Tai checkpoints. A Kenpai Tai sergeant bowed his gleam gleaming black Toyota crown exited the government complex, ferrying one of the Koshu's Japanese notables back to the Japanese settlement. Beneath his feet, Suzuki felt a faint rumble through the floor, the energy of an army of Cantonese Japanese civil servants swirling away under Japanese supervision. Yet nobody here, Suzuki amused, served Japan. <clears throat> it was no surprise. Years of distance just from Tokyo had led the tycoons of four companies of Sony, Matsushita, uh, Fujitsu, and Yasuda, as well as the outsider, Chiong Kong, drink deep and greedily. To them, the Chinese were tired of the meager wages, the Cantonese Japanese chased feudal dreams, and the Japanese were wedded to handsome dividends. Suzuki snubbed out his cigarette. Turning back to the mountain of charts littering his desk, the challenge of bringing Guangdong back into the Japanese fold loomed even higher, but it's Suzuki, an architect of Japan's wartime economy, it was just one more puzzle to solve. Sunlight fades, and a city bathes in neon and fluorescent lights. <clears throat> so here's the legislative council. We've got Sony. Oh, President Morita Akio. Which, I'll be honest, I think I want to do this one, because I, I, I am a little bit of a Sony pony, not as much as I used to be, but, but it's Matsushita. Matsushita. We have 15 seats for uh, Fujitsu. 25 seats for Yasuda, oh boy, and 30 seats for Suzuki's administration. So, legislative history. Oh. In fact, one time reduction of our revenue to boost product innovation. Oh. Uh, police augmentation ordinance. History in the Legislative Council. Fail the vote. <laughs> in fact, increase police fighting and clarify jurisdiction with the Kenpai Tai. Labor Rehabilitation Ordinance. Fail the vote. Expand the use of incarcerated labor on a contract of the four companies. Contact a contract arbitration ordinance. Fail the vote. Expand Guangdong's course, courts to give local business better legal access. <clears throat> Revise banking ordinance. Pass. Uh, direct monetary authorities to lower bank capital requirements to spur lending. Uh, urban zoning ordinance. Both pass. Permit accelerated industrial development without restriction in the Three Pearls. Order of development passed. Authorize use of security forces to resolve government land negotiations and local services ordinance. Allows establishment of local utility companies instead of executive exclusive contracts. <clears throat> Inside Guangdong State of Corporations, something resembling a democratic parliament akin to the ones in Japan and Britain exists. Though these seats are not elected, rather they comprise hundreds of the most important businessmen in Guangdong. These businessmen are the ones who vote on the ordinances of Guangdong, which dictate policy in the future of the direction of Guangdong. The businessmen flock to where it's most profitable to be, and their votes on loyalty are traded as uh, currency by the different presidents of the main companies of Guangdong, or in some cases, bought a way to change the dynamics of the council. The chief executive proposes the ordinances of the Legislative Council, and should 50 seats support the ordinance, it will go into effect. The businessmen are not bound loyally to the corporation, however, for the ordinances of Guangdong. The usual voting period for it is 30 days, though exceptions can occur in special cases. An ordinance usually does not survive without changes, and might need amendments, which would be proposed by other parties to seek out more support, however. No ordinance could have more than five amendments. Whenever Bill's vote has been concluded, it will be achieved in the ordinance history, and will stay there to document the history of the Guangdong's Legislative Council. Ah, that's cool. So there's that. So we have this one, the same button. Um, this one's supposed to open up the regions of Guangdong GUI in the Decisions tab. So, let's go over here. Oh, wow. Between the Chinese mainland and the South Chinese Sea lies Guangdong, an artificial state with an artificial culture and identity. In this hot pot of Chinese Japanese culture lies the three main ethnic groups, the Chinese, Zhujin, and the Japanese, who in each state have their own level of approval for government. Each of these ethnic groups represents steps in the Cantonese societal ladder, and their support for a lack thereof can make or break the finances and stability of the state of Guangdong. Though it might not seem like in the midst of the bustling seas of the Three Pearls, Guangdong is a major refuge for its wealth for the outcasts and criminals of Japanese and Chinese society. The Chinese triads and Japanese Yakuza. Our own police force is not enough to stop these forces from overrunning our nation and turning into an opium den, but the ones who help us police these groups are as ferocious and corrupt, if not more so. The Japanese can't fight high, who hold the people obedient through violence and force. The amount a group 
The Mountain Group controls each state and potentially the majority of the Guangdong regions, and it will have a major effect on the different demographic support for Guangdong, Chinese, and Japan Japanese support for our government, and how corrupt or not our society will be. <coughs> Excuse me. So, Chokai. Oh, God. <coughs> Triads. Can't buy Thai. Of the police. Government support Yakuza. Yakuza. Japanese expats. Comprised almost 10% of the total population. Uh, Zujin. Emerging Cantonese Japanese hybrid culture. Comprised of 21%. Chinese of Zujin assimilation rate. Chinese. Interesting. Oh, interact with the police. Oh. Upgrading, making sure all the police equipment should allow them to be more effective in combating thugs and our enemies. Build police boxes and Choi Kai. Uh. Um. Well, increase the public presence of our officers should allow them to exert more control in the state. Oh, we have the Yakuza too. Uh. The Yakuza have gotten two codes in their dens. Don't give the reminder of who is supposed to be in control. Maybe we're appropriate a few bottles of quality alcohol. There's nothing cash can't buy in Guangdong, and that includes assets and businesses that allow us to maintain control of the streets. And the triads. Identify one of the storage facilities as triads are using to move drugs throughout the Guangdong. Launch a raid as soon as possible. Nothing cash can't buy in Guangdong, and that includes assets and businesses that allow us to maintain control of the state. Okay. So if we do this, they get more control no matter what. Every year of a quarter. Every quarter of a year. The GPF's presence will grow into our regime regions, keeping our streets safe and fighting crime. Holy crap. Japanese expats, especially in Koshu, Macau, Hong Kong. I like how they have demographics here too, that's really nice. Interesting. Oh, do we have Very interesting. The four companies. Yasuda, Sony, Matsushita, and Fujitsu. The continued cooperation of these four companies are integral to the stability and profit of Guangdong, of course. Yet their interests all diverge from each other and they continue to butt heads. This must be kept in absolute minimums so we cannot afford instability at this juncture. Thus, Chief Executive Suzuki will meet with all four companies to secure their support and keep everything stable. And here's their economy as well. So we have a small little surplus with a good amount of growth. <clears throat> that GDP ratio is not bad either. As we lowered army spending to like nothing. And we have quite a bit of social expenditure, so... A typical promotion scheme. It was a cloudy day in Macau, but Lam Le Ho Fai was feeling happy. A Zhujin office clerk in the record keeping office of Macau was up for the promotion after spending the requisite <clears throat> amount of time in the civil service. He thought about what he could get with the money that came with it. Better quality food from better hawkers, maybe instead of the 20, 30 yen snacks one got from the rank and file runs, perhaps a visit or two from a cheap restaurant. Electronics, perhaps? I heard the Sony a lot are coming up with cheap radios again. Maybe we can buy one of those to keep me amused at work, and I'm sure my girlfriend would love something from Masushita or even Fujitsu. But then Lam thought about it and realized that what his real focus should be on. No, all that's irrelevant. He can wait. Well, he needs a better place to live for me and my girlfriend. But as the clouds turned dark and the rain began pouring down, his boss called him in and introduced him to a new graduate from the home islands. His new superior, the one promoted instead of him to the position of a colonial administrator, it took all of Lam's strength not to be passive aggressive or start hurling insults. Lam's hope had been crushed, dejected. He went out to lunch, feeling the world go gray. It was a grim day in Macau, and Lam Ho Fai felt grim. <clears throat> Pretty normal. But we're led by uh, despotists here. There's also a little bit of fascism and uh, paternalism. Ooh, we want more paternalism. Morita Akao. Uh, well, someone's been asking me every single like video I've done up to the release of this to play as Macau. Or not Macau. Morita Akao. 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 <clears throat> so, we'll see the ja missing Japanese. At the former Peninsula Hotel in Hong Kong, now the Daikoku Hotel in Hong Kong, a group of Hong Japanese. Senior bureaucrats and executives sat around a table filled to the brim with the best possible food the hotel's chefs could possibly offer. There was nothing that one could not find and feast on that t at that table. Fugu, expensive sashimi, even foreign delicacies from Germany and smuggled in American comfort food. <coughs> As these elites gourmets or gourmandized and stuffed their stomachs to the brim twice or three times over, they discussed the latest gossip, legislation of the council, the impact it might have on their businesses, and so on and so forth. They also blabbed out about the most recent news from Japan, Prime Minister Ino's constant search for growth. The warnings uttered by Ikeda and Takagi, nothing was off limits. Slurs and insults of those they deemed other and less than, such as Morita Akeo, are the Chinese word liberally used. If someone were to ask these people about the possibility of conflict of interest, they would say conflict of interest? Never met her. She from Beijing? 
The discussion shifted from, to the topic of someone who had been missing from the conversation. Where is Son Sonada? How long has it been since he was here last? It's been a few weeks since I waged him. An investor offer offer what he had what info we have. I heard the poor wretch lost everything on a bad investment and then disappeared before they could collect. Most people ex exchanged grim looks, but if you're kind of laughed out loud. She would have collected on the dude sooner. If he could disappear into the mass of Chinese like you say he has, there's nothing we can do now. And at that, the leads chuckled and went back to their gossip. Us and her lecture. In a chilly, uninspiring boardroom, you know, gazed out. Prime Minister, you know. Gazed out of the window to watch over the skyline and the illuminating buzz of the city. It was accompanied by Suzuki. With a greeting, you know, to discuss matters of affairs between the two nations. The great man cleared his throat, beginning to speak before turning his head to face Suzuki, who he found sat in a leather chair not far from his seat. Suzuki, you and I both know the use of companies. <clears throat> Operating in the South. They will bring you riches before you can blink, and as I am sure you are aware, they'll get you the moment they turn your back on them. That's a tough line to walk, keeping the companies in check, but I trust you're able to do it and let the wealth flow down the Pearl River. Eno set himself down and leaned back into his chair with a grin on his face, fattening off the pleasure he had just come from being the dominant speaker in the room. Suzuki clenched his jaw, acknowledging he was in no position to question Eno, drawing bated breath in front of his Japanese patron. Before he could get a word in, Eno coughed up more thoughts, testing the very fiber of Suzuki's attention. So, you know, the growth targets we took calculated for Guangdong, Eno uttered, mopping up his croaking voice. I have to. It'll have to meet what we expect this year. We can have four exceptions, and that problem with the Chinese also needs clearing up. If I'm honest, Suzuki, you've got a lot to do. Best get started sooner rather than later. It must be done every year. Tens of thousands of shareholders in the Japanese mainland expect their investments in Guangdong to make a return. They expect to see high growth. To reach these goals, business will continue as usual, but if they are missed, the potential consequences will be severe. For next year, our shareholders expect a real growth of 8% of GDP, or, or GDP of $23 billion. Oh, shnikes. So we got to balance all this. I don't need more Chinese support here. Uh, <coughs> but whatever. The three evils of Guangdong. The Republic of China's fa uh, opinion of administration is 40%. Their opinion affects their commitment towards our growth, influencing our annual GDP growth. Okay. Opinion extends far beyond beyond the support of us. The Chinese demographic and re region support adjusts according to the Republic's opinion. The try to see Chinese displeasure as an opportunity to grow in numbers and turn their influence as well. That was corruption. Holy crap, 50%. Affects the economic and political stability that our nation so desperately needs. As the corruption is currently between 40 and 60 percent, is the following effects: hurts the growth, <coughs> and Dainapon Taikoku's uh, approval, uh, gaining the approval of the Japanese is pivotal uh, to ensuring our continued economic prosperity and growth. Again, to the Japanese opinion, Japanese op approval will influence the Japanese expats government support for us accordingly. With the trust in the government, we expect to deliver them a sum of our earned profits, half a billion. For all good that our current standing brings, crime tends to follow where the money is. <coughs> So we really have to balance... Oh my god, there's even more here too. <coughs> Excuse me for my coughing. Despite our many advertisement campaigns, petty street corruption is still very much prevalent in Guangdong. As other directives have proven efficient, we must uh, send a small police force to pacify it at least for a while. Purge corrupt officers. Our officials. The corruption in Guangdong is becoming unmanageable. No matter how concentrated our efforts are, there's still some officials dedicated to the lawless ways. We must purge them for our society. That'd be actually really nice. Investigate Lego uh, member finances. Several Lego... Uh, Lego? Lego members are likely receiving team money to push different corporate corporate agendas. We'll continue to corrupt our legislature if they are not stopped. We must investigate members who might have these connections and reprimand them. Uh, and investigate rumored Yasuda connections. A wild rumor floating about, which Chief Executive Suzuki is very aware of, is that Yasuda and the representative Matsuzawa Takuji has some secret connections, which is corrupting the company. Having one of the four companies be corrupt is unacceptable, and Suzuki will make sure that they are investigated. Now, for opinion for the Chinese, we'll ask to meet with the Chinese Consul General to plead Guangdong's case. If they're available, otherwise we might meet with their security advisor who may be less receptive to our entreaties. Or request political backing. Oh. We'll ask Nanjing to ask the to and support our policy initiatives, but they'll not be pleased. Give more political power by Chinese radio airtime. By letting a company's program on Chinese radios, we can increase the interest of our products, though China would rather act as if we didn't exist. Oh. Appeal for more Chinese workers by appealing to the, Ref the Republic of China to simplify the immigration process in Guangdong. We can get more workers to power our factories, though the Chinese would prefer if we didn't exploit the people. That's not bad. What does it mean by 3%? Does that mean well, they'll, they'll like us 3% less? We get more growth, but approval from Japan now. We need to ask the Japanese Consul General to plead Guangdong's case. If they're available, otherwise, we might be the IJA garrison commander, who may not be very receptive. Political backing. Ask Tokyo to send to and support our policy initiatives, but not be pleased. Request more scientists. Increase base research points for all research. Oh. To further our research initiatives, we must ask Tokyo for more scientists. Though the brain dream will not please them, uh, solicit financial advice or aid. It will just get more money. As our reserves are running dry, we might lobby Tokyo for an infusion of cash. We will be seen as a drain of more than a benefit. I want to cut, crack down on corruption, personally. So, GDP. Um, wow, this is really freaking detailed. 
1960, all through 1960 up to where we're at right now. Guangdong GDP, Manchukuo uh, GDP as well. So their growth has been very, very bad. We're growing faster than them, which is pretty nice. Um, end of your target, 23 billion. Core economic statistics. Holy crap. Uh, the state of Guangdong was carved out of the Republic of China with one express purpose in the mind, using the Japanese engineering supremacy to create wealth benefiting both the greater East Co Asian coal prosperity sphere and investors back in Tokyo. A thousand investors who each day analyze Guangdong's economic performance from the comfort of the Tokyo Stock Exchange, however, demand return on investments, of course. Each year, Guangdong's economic performance in the form of pre-year GDP will be evaluated. To see if your economic growth has reached the goal the set the year prior, the state draws much of its uh, legitimacy from these evaluations. Therefore, they maintain great relevancy for the composition of the Legislative Council. Japanese approval of the demographics of Guangdong. The eventual goal for Guangdong is to overtake Japan's favorite subject, headquartered in Hinsing, 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 where the grand objective is managing a large economy than the Empire of Manchuria. That's a good goal. However, while growth and raw economic output remains paramount, maintaining a balance sheet uh, is a tantamount to upholding industry trust. Should our debt to GDP ratio uh, spiral upwards, our credit rating would take a hit, Japan would be growing more displeased, our political capital would be reduced, and trust in Guangdong's markets would be decreased, leading to an increase in inflation. Therefore, keeping our spending and debt in control of is a great importance for maintaining the miracle of the Pearl River. Heck yeah, that's all I'm here for. Uh, so right now, oh, yeah, this is bad. This is not good. Here's our real GDP growth, which I don't like. So I want to cut down on, on like all this stuff. Uh, purging corrupt officials probably is a bad idea. Well, increase Chinese government support. So, and with the political power, is that a good idea? Probably not. So we have fiscal health sound, which is very good for us. Very, very good. Uh, we have pervasive Kenpate networks, which is very bad for us. Not good. We have culture corruption, the finest money can buy, which is very bad for us. Monthly corruption goes up, impact on real GDP. Republic of China opinion of cap is not good. And we're between two worlds, which is also very bad. So we can't even delete our army. So, linking resources and labor. Coordinating product development. Ooh. <clears throat> sort of the police situation. Let me go to the Japanese elites. Well, we're going to go con coordinating product development. So those are the heart and soul of the Guangdong economic system, and the territory simply would not be where it is without the constant churning out of refined approved products demanded by the market's competition for consumers. Coordination between Yusuri, Sony, Matsushita, and Fu Fujitsu are central to the systems to be preserved. To prevent constricting and rivalry, Chief Executive Suzuki will see to it himself that the four companies will maintain their cooperation to ensure that products are released smoothly and at optimum intervals. The market will thrive on private enterprise, Suzuki insists, as large corporate firms produce goods that generate wealth and riches never before seen in the Southeast. Cool. So in 30 days, We'll get reduced by 12, which means we'll be below, almost below, below 40%. Solutions come easier with help. Chief Executive Suzuki tried not to shorten his, let his shortness of breath show as he entered the office, taking pains to slow his stride and mask his chest, heaving by straightening his tie. He made no such effort to hide his irritation at Prime Minister Eno, who stood languidly by the desk as if expecting a guest in Suzuki's own office. I'm sorry if you keep you waiting, Suzuki said dryly, though I'm sure, I'm, I'm afraid my cabinet secretaries will need me back shortly. Uh, a cabinet meeting? My apologies. Eno dipped his head slightly, a formality without feeling. I was just thinking about a conversation the other day. And I might be able to help you. You were aware of the Malayan problem, yes? Of course, Suzuki had read the reports of the ongoing peace preservation operations in Xiongnan for years by, uh, for now, by now. But what about it? The IJA garrison reports to Tokyo not. The army needs new rifles, Suzuki. Eno barreled over Suzuki. Standard issue isn't enough to flush out those guerrillas. I see, Suzuki digested in Eno's statements. You realize that <clears throat> the companies here make electronics, not weapons. Why not ask the Maturians? I'm asking you, Eno said firmly. I can get the army ministry to request proposals. All I have to do is submit a design. We'll sign a contract, you get paid. I don't see what the problem is. Uh, Suzuki fixes one's junior in the Tojo cabinet with a wary eye. The army, sir, was rarely so careless with the contracts to turn to first time manufacturers, but Eno had always been a deal maker, and Suzuki needed it a whim. I'll see what the companies can do. An honest living. Chao Man Chui lived in a world of other people's routines. He woke according to the stranger's clocks, in a schedule decided by other, others' movements, and made his way to work just when others were leaving theirs. As the owner of a Dai Pai Dong, a small outdoors restaurant stalls, work depended on timing. He knew open to all 2100 hours sharp so that it would be ready and waiting for the workers emerging hungry and tired of the shift change. But his work had become an art. Thanks to government fees, most of the money he made went straight to the cost for the stall, and his business existed in a delicate state. It always been like this before. Before the Japanese had come, he had been a chef at a large restaurant. Now some rickety stall serving the elite of the Pearl River Delta. Out of the Japanese who had arrived, they expropriated the restaurant and evicted the Chinese chef chefs, preferring Japanese for the positions while the natives were relegated to being waiters and busboys. It had been a rough time for him, but the Pai Dai, uh, dai Pai Dong had been a godsend. His reverie of memories was interrupted by the chatter of the first arriving customers. He had accumulated loyal regulars who came for his conversation just as much as his food, so he smiled broadly at their arrival. Three dishes of beef chow fun, a bowl of sog sa kwa porridge, and a bowl of wonton noodles. One of his regulars, a man named Chen, said the workers had a mighty appetite after their lengthy shifts, and Chow immediately set about making their order. He had his place in this city. Even after everything had happened, he worked with a small smile on his face. Order up. 
I don't want any sort of corruption. No corruption. We need more GDP. Oh, there's a growth here too. So the the Manchurian growth is like 2% or worse. And ours has been like 7% every year, which is a nice debt GDP ratio. Oh, Manchuko is really bad. <coughs> a shining crown jewel. If there's any place in all of China that show what the Japanese had done to the country, it was Koshu, formerly Guangzhou. The once proud city had been reduced to a choking mass of factories and processing plants spewing pollutants into the Pearl River Delta. Surrounding these factories with sprawling slums on planet on a crowd of beyond belief. The only investment of the corporate overlords, meanwhile, had seen the fit to recommend was the addition of suicide nets in the factories, so as to prevent the workers from taking unauthorized periods of extended leave, as they put it. <coughs> Rubbing the pact. And filthy streets outside, meanwhile, was one armed, handless, and otherwise disfigured men in bloody bandages who had suffered industrial accidents that rendered them incapable of handling machines, even without a means of income. The sight of these unfortunates served as a never ending reminder to those who have to work that, yes, it could get worse. Even as it seemed that their workforce bled itself dry for the insatiable appetite of the sphere, those who ran the factories knew well that the intense competition for even the worst jobs meant that they would never run out of the willing flesh to put into the machine. Though the bars and the brothels had doubted Koshu and the used the strongest neon signs available on the market to attract those who so made it rightful, t so made it to nightfall. <coughs> It seemed not even that light could go through the dense, suffocating smog that filled every part of the city. Now, as the demands for more and more goods reach the city, factory owners have taken more creative ideas for boosting the output. Some have chosen to experiment with instituting mandatory unpaid overtime, others have decided to employ children whenever possible. Regardless of the means, the result is the same. Demands to ramp up manufacturing, which anywhere else in the world would have been considered impossible, have been met with little difficulty. A crown jewel for sure, but one wonders about the shining. An evening in the wet market. On a cloudy, smoky, and grim evening, the Lokai Yitsi, one of the millions of housewives in the city of Koshu, wandered through the city's wet market. Her purpose was twofold, looking for goods in the, for the night's supper and trying to find things to prepare for the upcoming Lunar New Year. Another year passed since she had followed her husband, who had headed south from his and her rural village somewhere in Shaogaan to find work, as frequently happened. She was bothered by feelings of regret. She wished she had, they hadn't left. She's seen the beggars in the streets without arms or legs, eaten alive and sped up by the brutal factories. And though she might look lack literacy, she wasn't blind. She could see the occasional body of the suicide net strung up above virtually every street. She hoped her husband wouldn't end up like that, but she knew quite well that the will of heaven was not something that one could influence by hoping her hopes or predictions. Not being willing to lay down and die, all she could do was focus on the passing days, picking and choosing between wilted vegetables and preserved meats to preserve until you until the morrow. At that moment, her ruminations were interrupted. She found a good deal, a wide smile across her face as she handed over the yen and took the food into her bag. She and her husband would have something better than normal to eat this new year, and they made her so happy. After all, her husband's happiness was hers, as his, as hers was his. True, she, true, she had married him for love, but the two had to learn to love each other, and that made the heck of iron uh, that Guangdong was so much more bearable. Therefore, since the world has, has still much good, but much less good than ill, the tycoons of Guangdong. The front man in the chief executive's office took their time settling into the black leather sofas, right, ringing Suzuki's desk. A haughty familiar excluding a disdain for Suzuki's authority. These men, Matsuzawa Tokuji of Yasuda Bank, Matsushita Masaharu, Masaharu of Matsushita Electric, Ibuka uh, Masoru of Fujitsu, and Morita Akeo of Sony were the tycoons of the four companies of Guangdong and they had long been used to breaking Tokyo's emissaries to the world. Frankly, Suzuki, you're wasting your time, Mubuka said archly. Cocking his chin in defiance, Guangdong was established so that enterprising businessmen like ours could operate unrestrained by Tokyo. You know the first to say otherwise, you won't be the last. The chief executive is just resetting his man mandate. We have ours, I'm sure I'll understand, Matsushita chided. A long side glance at Suzuki sooner or later. Tokyo is well aware of the promises. It's promises, Suzuki growled, resisting the urge to throw his papers into Mubuka's face. But as subject to the empire, your nation has high expectations of men like yourself. Marita said nothing. He was the only man out, Suzuki thought. The gadgeteer of Guangdong had disappeared from Japan in 1952 before surfing in Hong Kong in 1954 with the fabled local associates. Every chief executive has had the same mandate, Matsuzawa interceded, ever the gentleman banker. But Suzuki, an esteemed member of the House of Peers, has evidently cut above the rest. I'm sure his proposal has some merit. At that, they suddenly raised their eyebrows and Suzuki smiled. Tokyo has many ways to make itself heard. And we have the uh, Silicon Delta, history products. Uh, 961 SDLD facsimile, cool, underperforming. The TV was uh, launch was middling, uh, Falcon was middling, the radio was incredible, the rice cooker 57 was incredible as well. So lately, things have not been looking so good for us. Radio was underperforming, radio was middling, underperforming for the Falcon 100, the refrigerator was middling, TV was great, and it was middling as well for the telephone, tech for telephone. So, product cycle. We want to see the companies of Guangdong as fierce wars vying for each other's hands. Then the annual product launch would be their dueling ground. Their prize electronics, sharp edge, katanas will land the fatal blow. The path through the Legislative Council with state-of-the-art products is fraught with intricacies. For the successful launch of each and every product, two factors are indispensable, quality control and advertising. Product quality, 
occurs. The trust of investors into our endeavors, while sufficient advertisement accumulates consumer tar- interest from targeted as well as potential markets. <coughs> it is through a steady stream of successful launches that Guan Thong shall maintain its financial prestige and contribute to our part to the greater East Asia Cold Prosperity Spheres, global power projection, the both soft and hard. But even if product manufacturing allows dormant technology does not, for our brightest engineers and researchers across the three pearls shall toil day in and day out for the constant perfection of our releases and the optimization of our state apparatus. A product cycle will typically last 100 days, at which our creation will be put to the test in the murky waters of the capital, depending on how well both the quality and popularity is, releasing a product of immense quality and popularity, and watch the political clout and its parent company skyrocket, uh, releasing an inferior product, however, everything might come crashing down. No focus. Audio and video monthly research speeds being impacted by several different factors. Uh, household electronics monthly research speeds being impacted by several different factors as well. As well as data storage, computational power, and a power efficiency progress. Cool. Identify the breakthrough. Subsidized loss. Ooh. Sort of local police. A deal in debate. Or deal uh, to deal in debts. Out of the tense meeting with the tycoons and Chief Executive Suzuki and Matsuzawa Takuji, the chief representative of the Institute of Financial Conglomerate Guangdong remained seated in Suzuki's office. As we discussed, we have my full cooperation cooperation. Matsuzawa spoke in a measured tone, hiding his irritation behind a mask of perfect courtesy. Uh, Yasuda is ready, is, is ready to support Prime Minister Ino's wishes however we can. Having Yasuda's cooperation is reassuring, Suzuki said, stubbing out his cigarette in a half-full ashtray, as assured Matsuzawa, your assistance is deeply appreciated. Thank you, Matsuzawa, replied coolly. He wasn't used to being beholden to anybody, given his profession. To be a banker was to deal in debts and to transmute profits with interest into a more brilliant career. But that had ground to haul with his transfer of banishment from Tokyo to Guangdong. He didn't know why he'd been exiled, but after three years he found that he would do almost anything to go back. Matsuzawa, I wanted to ask. Suzuki's question brought Matsuzawa back to reality. Do you know anything about financing trade payments between Japanese yen and the military yen? Matsuzawa blinked. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know. Anything involving the military's currency is running out of Tokyo. Why? Nothing serious. Suzuki's face twisted in disappointment frowned. D- just asking. Matsuzawa made a note. Call Tokyo. The island. Take a careless stride along a certain section of the northern coast of the Pearl River, and one can vaguely make out the concrete, lifeless fortresses lying on the other side. Ask any elder residing nearby, either running as a tea shop with his family, or alone on the streets, and he would often offer musings about an army of stone-faced men in khaki, khaki sitting up from the island of barricades with almost unsettling vigilance. Of the origins of the purpose they serve, he would not know, nor the truth is that the men on the other side do not come to serve, but to a police monitor. A specialized, fully support, uh, supply garrison of the Imperial Japanese Army, accompanying the Guangdong civil authorities since its conception, ready to mount her landing crafts and intervene at a moment's notice, should Guangdong be devoured by our own capitalist insanity. Which your elders certainly would recall, however, as a fertile legacy bequeathed upon the very soil the Japanese army ministered on, a dream crushed beneath the invader's boot and interned under the Wailing River waters. On the island was once an academy, none other than the Chiang Kai shek as its headmaster, a flaming forge of revolutionary fervor from which hundreds of brilliant, able men emerged and threw themselves into chess crusade against the dark age of warlordism. But alas, such was an era gone by. Within mere decades, those same men, brilliant men would all perish in senseless infighting. Meaning their demise on smoldering battlefields, they were finding themselves vanquished to remote corners of a lost homeland, or as the white sun lay conquered by the red, to the blood of millions irrigating its crimson rays. One poa, silent tears would well up in the elder's eyes as he whispered the long lost names, but here it will the emperor's soldiers not, nor will the men in suits overlooking Koshu atop their mountains of gold. It is. Uh, to this fate that the island was consigned itself, just as another nameless patch of soil, another insignificant stroke upon the co prosperity sphere's grand design. A relic alone in the shifting tides of history. What do I do next? Japanese elite, increased support. It's good to have more support from everybody. Yoko Haidike's notorious racket. Trick it, work together with the Yakuza. Suddenly hose amazing commodities. Check the budget. Ooh, more growth. Well, that's not bad, too. I want more growth. Linking resources and labor. Underneath the very soil we build our homes and roads upon the bountiful amounts of minerals buried in the sediment. Chromium, tungsten, and other natural resources that can flood the economy with riches are just beneath their feet. It's a surprise that authorities have not permitted the excavation of these precious materials beforehand. Let us open up private access to the resources and permit the corporations themselves quarry the riches from beneath the surface. With the approving rich stamp from the chief executive, an army of min- miners, excavators, and machinery will be prepared to march into the countryside, where they'll extract the minerals directly. We expect nothing but reports of skyrocketing profits from these corporations and happy investors with pockets lined with green. Lunch at Kantonken. Matsushita Masaharu. 
Masaharu. Watch Fujitsu's Ibuka Masaru uh, dig hungrily into the plate of chill shrimp, leaving him marveling as he sipped his jasmine tea as half-finished serving up a shumo grown cold. Uh, the two have chosen the Kanton Ken, a leading Cantonese restaurant in Guantang's Japanese quarter, though Matsushita suspected that no Cantonese dish would be looked as red or tasted as sweet as Ibuka's shrimp for working lunch. Please take your time, Masushita remarked ghibli, resisting the urge to check his grand psycho watch up enough to spare. I spent my time in the lab and I built an appetite. Ibuka paused, his chopsticks long enough to look Masushita in the eye through his dressy eyeglasses. Try some time to help your sales. <clears throat> the chief executive is cozying up to Yasuda as a danger to both of us. Masushita let Ibuka's challenge slide. Tokyo has always wanted more to say in how we make money here, but Su now Suzuki has the support to do it. You don't have to tell me how dangerous Suzuki and Yasuda's alliance is. He Buka Shuka said dismiss dismissively. You know you ought to be hard at working on the next stereo, color TV, or a competing machine, but people like them only know how to get in the way. I heard you might surprise with something that will hit both our bottom lines, Mosushita shuddered. Can you imagine? We can't have that, can we? Ibuka noted darkly, placing his, chops placing his chopsticks down. The chief executive needs to learn that things change around here to serve us, whether he likes it or not, just like the food around here. She owe me the money. Chef Sweet crashed to the ground, his poorly body quivering amidst the two splintered remains of the plastic table scattered on the binge suit. In his bin, bin suit. Two men, the only other men in the shop, everyone else having scattered at their arrival, crushed down in front of him, their tattoos peeking out from the seats of the silver suits. You understand? I don't want to have your money. The shopkeeper raised his hand as he stammered a broken Japanese, his palms facing outward to both signal surrender and his poverty. Please, I'll pay you back this, this week's earnings, but you can't keep scaring. Sca scaring? Scaring? The older of the two sneered at the shopkeeper's face as his junior handed him a hefty gleaming cleaver. I think you're not scared enough. No, wait, please. The color drained from Sui's face as he stammered, his eyes widening at the side of the play. I handed everything to another gang yesterday. Four or five men speaking Cantonese threatened to break my arm if I didn't. Two thugs looked at each other, the top triads, encroaching on their turf for the third time in many months. I matched with all the stories from all the other shopkeepers in that district and explained how how broke Sui was despite himself. They pulled the blade back from Sui's neck, resolving that there are far better trackers to be had. We'll be nice to the Yokozo thug snapped. Spittle flying on a sweet face, but if you don't have your money next week, then we'll help ourselves to this little shop of yours. Maybe even your precious wife and daughter. Consider them collateral to settle your debts with us. Assassins and save souls. Sony. Modular rifle Mark 1, easily just well compatible with multiple amounts of ammo types. Masushita, special function weapon prototype. Lightweight fletchlet ammunition, superior penetrative power. Fujitsu, experimental type 1 rifle, integrated light vision optics with portable uh, battery. Suzuki's lips curled in distaste as he flipped through the design specific, uh, specifications. Submitted by Sony, Matsushita, and Fujitsu, Prime Minister Ino had built a replacement rifle bill proposal as the next generation competition, but Suzuki had seen nothing worthy of the title among the candidates. He scouted Sony's promise of adjustability and ammo compatibility, fulfilling a non-existent need in Japan or its closest client militaries. It might be good for export, I suppose, but that hadn't even been in the Army's requirements. As for Masushita, the man had put together a dart gun. A focus on a lightweight weapon was useful at first glance and fit Masushita's emphasis on design well, but it would be no go for the exact opposite reason as Sony, creating a logistical nightmare for what non existent. And Fu Fujitsu? Well, Suzuki admitted he was intrigued by the possibility of improved night optics. He had nearly fallen out of his chair laughing when he saw the dimensions of the portable battery. A car battery ripped out of an engine and strapped to the man's back. He supposed he shouldn't have expected much. They were all newcomers to the needs of military equipment in a show, but all the matter was picking one and submitted to Tokyo and to spare himself any further mental agony. Spent half a billion, uh, half of 0.1 billion. Starting to decide whether experimental rifle project will subsidize for advancing field testing. The field testing, you know, will be deployed, ready to be sent to Malaya. To uh, not run over budget, the PTRG in this and in all future projects has a deadline of a year before they're forced to pull out of the conflict. Surely the PTRG is under control and needs to have a general assigned to track progress. Holy crap! Choice of infantry equipment project to subsidize for testing, research and development for marketing towards CPS member states. Fuj Fujitsu Matsushiri. Matsu sh sh Shita Matsushita Subsidize High experimental thermographic scope requires large external battery Passive ambient moonlighting amplifying scope for not time use uh, Special function Lightweight frame High velocity 6mm fletcher ammo and bore riding habits Divine for rapid fire with low recoil very high capacity Modular if truffle for both Japanese and Chinese ammo 3 shot underslung grenade gun Highly adaptable design for marketing to widespread potential demographics. We'll go with Sony. Oh! Experimental Rifle Division. Oh, look at this. That's so cool. R&D support. Uh. Sure. Guess go ahead. Wow. Glider planes, they have a lot here.
It's an active service, yes. Um, 44% chance. Monthly corruption goes down with this one. Okay then. So right now we're at 50% corruption. This is still going on, my god. Oh, the testing stuff here too. Alright, so carry out rubber crossings in combat conditions. Test rifles in urban combat. Use equipment in conditions exceeding 25 degrees. Use rifles in jungle environment. Find amount of conditions. And product testing deployment in Malaya. We skin up objectives to be satisfied with product testing in Malaya. Let us pull out and avoid wasting additional resources. Delete the division template and remove all units created for this template. The outcome of the product draws depend on how many research objectives we fulfill in the field of battle. Manufacture des additional testing rifles. Keep our testing division uh, rifles at optimal strength. We need manufacturing and ship additional rifles to them. Wait, do we need to send it over to them? I don't understand. Do not overrun a budget. We have one year faster budget. Or hearing a call. Suzuki and Masa, Matsuzawa were 40 minutes in a morning meeting uh, considering the Legislative Council when a shrill sh rain came out from the Chief Executive's chambers. I'm sorry to interrupt, the Secretary bowed meekly as Suzuki's brow nodded in annoyance. Yasuda headquarters for Matsuzawa, uh, Matsuzawa said it was urgent. I'll take it, Matsuzawa cut off the Secretary as he briskly left, lifted himself out of the seat. Hopefully this won't take too long. Minutes passed. Suzuki felt a twinge of pain as his last cigarette burned down to the stub in his fingers, cursing he made for a vending machine next to the elevators before being stopped and distracted by Matsuzawa's frustrated voice. The payments of Guangdong were being made by the home office, the Minazaka account. It was always them. What about Eno now? I thought this wasn't going to be an issue. You're darn right this isn't how I wanted to hear about this. Suzuki nearly jumped. It wasn't all like Matsuzawa's to shop. He scrambled back to his office and flopped in his seat. Mind racing. Something was going on with Yasuda and Guangdong. Something connecting his Minazaka firm and Prime Minister Eno. It could be nothing, but it felt like nothing, not from Matsuzawa's tone. Was Matsuzawa hiding something? Something that could make you such a liability? Suzuki felt a cold, clammy way wash over him at the thought. He suddenly wished he had forgotten to buy cigarettes. Payments? Could seriously linking these two? Check the Asuda payments. Oh boy. So how do we get river crossings, huh? An opportunity. Very little could be heard about the uh, clicking of chopsticks and the waiter's shouts in the dip. Uh, sweltering eatery of Hong Kong's Sheung Wang. Nothing of importance could ever be overheard in the raucous din without a would-be age driver revealing themselves, which was exactly how Morita Akio wanted. Never mind that there were, no, were more private locations, such as Tony's headquarters in Central. The egg noodles were firm, the wontons and uh, saishin fresh. It had kept Morita alive since he washed up in Guangdong a decade ago. They trusted the man who had introduced him to the place, now sitting opposite him to keep interlopers out. Akio Suzuki has been sent by uh, Tokyo to get Guangdong working for Japan, same as everyone else before him. Li Ka Xing, the head of the Chung Kong retail conglomerate, said exasperately, How will this time be any different? Up until now, every chief executive has been brought to, brought to heel by Yasuda. Matsushita and Akio, Akio spat the next name out, Ibuka. But the he is Yasuda is not in lockstep with the other two anymore. He'll need a deciding vote. It's the best opportunity we have to level the field. As Suzuki had come to us first, I'd be with you. But right now, Yasuda has all the cards, Li Shuka said. Shouldn't we focus on diversifying? We have money now, we should be dry banking, giving us something back to the Zujin and the Chinese who backed us. And make an enemy of Yasuda? We're back to score one, Marita groan. Politics is the art of the possible. Ah, appropriate role M. Information filtered back from the local authorities, as well as from the representatives from the invested corporations, has informed the House of Peers an issue concerning the excavation of natural resources in the rural regions. People will live on top of them. Uh, thankfully, Suzuki is just a plan. Assigning an eminent domain, a forcible eviction order to acquire the land from these villagers in exchange for a small pittance. We can expect to see them off and finally begin working and developing the natural resources of the region. Such a minuscule hurl cannot halt the development of Guangdong, nor prevent riches from flowing down the Pearl River. We'll have a province, peasants or not. So, with this, um, I guess we'll see what we can Oh, you know what? River crossing? We get like right there, maybe? Yeah. Uh, in the every cry of every man. <coughs> a man sits. It says screaming in the middle of a room. His eyes flicking frantically like little candles caught in a gust. Tears soon boil from them. He sees nothing but world of, the world of blur. However, he has no wish to see, not after what he has witnessed, not after he has lost his friend. 
A cross from the crowd of figures sits another man, one that is at least somewhat smartly dressed. While grim and calm, he lazily reaches for the necessary paperwork. He asks for the trembling man's name, no response. He grunts then. When, to his growing annoyance, he has a displeasure to hear the erratic shuffling of the man's frantic limbs. Meanwhile, the trembling man's mind hurls around. He can't understand what pulled his friend into that wretched machine. Did he succumb to the aching tiredness? Did he lose focus? Could he have just simply given up on his exhausted life? Nothing makes sense, yet he cannot tear himself away from the horrors of his thoughts. He will return tomorrow to work. He has no other choice. The manager's paperwork will be filled and nothing will change. He can only hope that he will not be the next to suffer a similar fate. The Death Yasuda payments. Suzuki had waited it well until well into the evening to begin, poring over the transaction settlement records from the Bureau of Finance, just one of the many records he had seemingly requested a random from Guangdong's government. I wouldn't do to have a, a swirling rumor or a discernible pattern surrounding what he was doing. Yasuda surely didn't need to know that Ali was looking into the cracks of their business. Suzuki poured over the tables under a fluorescent desk light, tracking any mention of Yasuda or Minazaka payments over the past six months into his notebook. A transaction from Yasuda's Tokyo home office to Minazaka did exist, more precisely. The Yasuda home office was Minazaka's only counterparty. Suzuki leaned back at his desk. From what he had understood of the Japanese banks, they would normally ask their local branches to handle payments to counter local counterparties. Barring some mistakes where the home office might be forced to intervene. Yasuda Tokyo's payments to Minazaka were too consistent for that. Their home office was involved in something on the side of Guangdong, beyond their regular business. None of, them, none of this proved anything of importance to Suzuki about whether Yasuda could be trusted or not. It was unusual, yes, evidence of wrongdoing, no, but if Yasuda's home office was so deeply involved in Guangdong already, perhaps they would be doing other things. What else is Yasuda up to? I'll crack down uh, show research decisions. Um, so we're still here. We're at 38%, which is actually not bad. Um, oh, look at this. So we have better monthly corruption, better political power, better monthly government support, and better probably Republic of China uh, opinion cap, which is nice, which is better overall. Less corruption, please. Growth is still not great. So, so plus is not bad, though. Um, <clears throat> and we're still going to appropriate the rural land. Um, so, yeah. That'll be enough to do. So, where's the research stuff? Oh, show research decisions, yes. Oh, my God. Prioritize audio and video research. For the time being, we'll send our R&D teams to prioritize advancements in audiovisual presentation methods. This, of course, provide a clear advantage to Sony in upcoming product development cycles. On a further note, audiovisual products tend to gain the most attention from the consumer market. Electronic household luxuries are the saddest symbols of our time, and anyone who can afford them is willing to pay for those symbols. After all, nothing brings in buyers like flash and style. Prioritize household electronic research. For the time being, we'll send our R&D teams to prioritize the design and development of new household electronics to put an end or to put on the consumer market. Matsushita Electric Company will be poised to take advantage of our sponsored research and will no doubt reap its benefits come future product development cycles. Our domestic development will also be aided by our focus on citizens. Uh, we'll find that their access to a modern luxury is greatly improved. In the future of the living means washing machines, refrigerators, and rice cookers, the home of tomorrow is right around the corner. Prioritize data storage. For the time being, we will assign our R&D teams to prioritize the development of greater data storage capabilities to improve our overall development capabilities. In the process of developing numerous products and innovations, we have accumulated an immense amount of data. Some of this data is immediately applicable to ongoing projects, but often is true. Uh, value will only come much later and in very different contexts. Lessons learned from the one to development cycle might be crucial to the development of a product cycle two cycles after. With that in mind, our scientists and engineers have become quite averse to looking uh, or losing any information gained from the work, as this philosophy has proven its value on the more than one occasion, we are inclined to oblige them. <clears throat> Computational power research. I just kind of want to power Sony. For the time being, we will assign our R&D teams instead to prioritize the development of greater computing capabilities and the requisite hardware needed to maintain such capabilities. Such a decision to elevate computational research will naturally give Futsu Fujitsu Limited a leg up in future product development cycles. Additionally, any breakthroughs made in the sector will be just as easily put back to use into the R&D capabilities as it puts money into Ibuka Masaru's uh, pockets. If Fujitsu claims to be the future, we better get on in on the success. And then a uh, power efficiency research. The time being, we'll send R&D teams to prioritize power efficiency improvements for government electronics. While not contributing directly to the profitability of our profits uh, or products, it'll uh, improve our overall administrative capabilities and economic development. Our resource extraction operations will benefit from improved optimization, not to mention the automated systems and the factory complexes. Ooh. And best in focus research. At any given time, our R&D teams are likely focusing on several different uh, efforts at once, all in service to the development of our products. During periods of normal development, this approach is not problematic indeed. It has been a crucial part of our ability to stay at the top of the global tech industry. There are times, however, when it is helpful to narrow our focus and make a concerted effort with every resource we have towards a single goal, be that a design bottleneck or specific innovation that will be instrumental in future projects. Of course, such a marshalling of resources requires a good deal of invested capital to produce results that will make up for the venture's uh, opportunity cost, <clears throat> or force scientists into overtime. 
No development project can succeed without their brain power and manpower to back it up. It is thanks to the efforts of our dedicated scientists that we have been so successful in staying on the cutting edge of consumer-ready technology. As with any development endeavor, though, there's always more work to be done and not enough time to do it all in. Given the absolute necessity of the annual development cycle of our economy, we have a responsibility to repair our products as quickly and efficiently as possible. Sometimes this necessitates difficult choices, such as our allocation of R&D manpower hours. To put it bluntly, we can improve the rate at which a development progresses by ordering our teams to put in more shifts for longer periods. It's not something we can do lightly, however, as it will take as also necessitate paying out extra wages, and not look beyond favorably by the Japanese expat community from which we draw our best and brightest. And then cut quarters and research. <clears throat> and the race to put out the next big thing and further cement Guangdong's economic ascendancy, there's more than a little pressure to put certain standards aside that means quicker development period, naturally. It isn't something to be broadcasted to the rest of the world and our competitors, but it'd be naive to expect them to adhere to a rule simply because we do out of any sense of fairness. To look for any such thing in Guangdong is to have been seriously misled. No, the real danger of expediting our progress by quietly ignoring certain cumbersome tests and rules is that we might slip up and release a truly dysfunctional product. Some things are bound to be overlooked here and there, but by keeping our time-saving measures reasonable, we can maintain our level of quality within an acceptable devi deviation. So we're going to do this one and this one maybe? Hmm. Let's go with that one. Audio and visual, I guess, plus for now. Yeah. I guess we'll see. The military end connection. Even while knowing that Yasuda's home offices were engaged in activity onshore, diving into the details of other transactions without asking Yasuda directly proved to be an odyssey through a mountain of currency requisition forms, poorly filled clearance requests, and yellowing transaction receipts. After several days, however, patterns emerged. While the purpose of Yasuda's transactions were all valid at first glance, the amounts of were nearly invariable whole numbers. Large ones, around a million yen here, a neat hundred thousand yen there. When one might expect Exact figures from a bank interested in recording the exact comings and goings of every yen in its custody. You see, his home office seemed oddly content to accept it conveniently rounded numbers at regular intervals. Hallmark signs of sloppy accounting conducted for fraud. What made Suzuki's hair stand on Ed, however, was it currently being accepted? The Japanese military yen. <clears throat> Suzuki, a former general, was familiar with the use of the military yen during the war. As a stopgap measure, while new currencies tied to the Japanese civilian yen were introduced, but Guangdong had transitioned quickly to the Guangdong yen post war in order to maintain its all important confidence of Japanese investors. A brisk trade occurring in military yen on the great fringes of Guangdong's military economy will let a policy remain well in ex excess of what the budget for the IJA garrison or Kampai Thai activities should permit. As an obvious conduit for fraud and corruption with the students' fingerprints all over it. What's uh, Matsuzawa's connection then? Nice. Oh, closed for now. We'll see what happens. House electronics progress. Regions. Corruption is not bad. 39% is still a bit too high, but we're still going to lower it by 7.5%, so that's pretty good overall. Uh, so, with this one, we're getting our boys up here. Let's see what we can do. Land of Opportunity. Hiroshi Yamauchi disembarked from the combat passenger ship that had transported him across the turquoise and turbulent ocean, sipping on the concrete docks of a port. A shorty, Hong Kong. With his arrival, he carried with him the burden and weight of the legacy of his family, a duty to resuscitate a winning endeavor, a venerable yet struggling and unremarkable business focused on the production of recreational goods, namely playing cards. Yamauchi's business is considerably old, being established by an experienced craftsman decades ago with the purpose of the production of traditional Japanese Hanafuda uh, playing cards. Throughout the years, the family remained true to the roots, finding slight success in the brief period of post-war prosperity in Japan, but alas, the nature of the economic markets continuously fluctuate. It was the surprise of nobody when the market of cards at Yamauchi, a specialism began uh, to be saturated and profits began dropping. New routes had to be considered. To Yamauchi and many others abroad, Guangdong was a golden land of opportunity, a place where humble businesses and upstarts could thrive and develop, supported by the measures of the current chief executive, Suzuki Taichi. As matters became more tenuous on the home islands, Yamauchi turned his attention towards the opportunities that the third per Three Pearls had offered and departed from many more lucrative shores. He certainly was not the first, as made evident by the four corporations dominating the administration, and he certainly would not be the last. Yamauchi took a deep breath of the tangy air of the Delta and smiled. Here, Nintendo will find success and prosperity. The company will finally be put on stable footing. <clears throat> now, to lay the foundations in a small price to pay. With a cigarette in hand, Suzuki poured over the piles of charts and documents on his well furnished mahogany desk. He barely reacted to the faint knock on the door or the voice of the young secretary, chief executive. A key piece of the paperwork requires your approval. May I enter? <clears throat> Suzuki murmured for him to come in without much thought. The secretary gently placed a beige file upon the piles of documents ready on the desk, sitting inside respectfully as the chief executive opened it and examined the sheets of paper and maps contained within. It was a list of possible sites for resource extraction, specifically tungsten and germanium, both beneficial to Guangdong's industrial pursuits. Markings in red pen dotted the map. 
designating resource deposits along with their estimated part market value among them. Suzuki's odds are set upon one side in particular, a large deposit of tungsten that could easily be efficiently developed and exacted in optimal terrain, however a glaring issue to it as a sizable obstacle, a small village overlaying the site, with possibly hundreds, even thousands of inhabitants. To extract the resources present, he would have to move the entire population and alter the living conditions, many of whom would undoubtedly be extremely reluctant to leave, possibly requiring a large effort by the Kampai Tai. Suzuki, without any hesitation, stamps his approval upon the sheet of paper, so where was I? Restore the populace. <clears throat> the now homeless Chinese village is evicted from the lands now without anywhere to stay. And with unemployed laborers wandering in the countryside, Suzuki's drafted measures to effectively manage the unemployed opportunity, or our unexploited opportunity. Authorizing relocation orders, the communities of Chinese villages will be resettled into cities and urban zones in adjustment with the projected development of their territories. They'll come in droves by rail, shepherding from rolling hills to the concrete municipal municipalities, teeming with life. There, they can exchange their plowshares for the full shifts of backbreaking and intensive labor in the growing industrial economy, so they can work to afford food and shelter in the luminous, buzzing metropolis. Cool. Mazuzawa's resume. Graduate of the Tokyo Imperial University Law Faculty, hired at Yasuda Bank, Nihon Bashi Bakurocho Branch, uh, servicing corporate clients. Scripted as an officer candidate, discharged a second lieutenant in 1942 after deployment in Manchuria. Resigned to headquarters, namely Deputy Se Section Chief of Corporate Lending in 1947, age 34. Assigned to the Ministry of Finance, later assigned as a Section Chief of Corporate Lending. Commanded for a strategic vision, and promoted to head of personnel in 1956. General Manager for the General Affairs in 1958. Suzuki. Found himself nodding in quiet marvels he read over Mazuza. Matsuzawa's glittering career, tapping a cigarette against an ashtray, graduate of the Imperial Universities. Clearly groomed for success from the start, a general manager by 45, the man had lived a charmed life. Suzuki's reached his next line and pause, promoted to representative director in 1960, reassigned at Guangdong as regional director. Suzuki's eyebrows arched, the Zaibatsu tended to keep their future leadership in their home offices. Matsuzawa was clearly on that path, but he'd been resigned, reassigned to Guangdong. With a promotion and a fancy title sure, but nevertheless banished from Tokyo, luckily for angering someone above him in the corporate food chain, and there weren't that many above Matsuzawa at his level. Suzuki extinguished a cigarette with a frustrated sigh. That explained what, uh, why Matsuzawa was so eager to work with Suzuki. Matsuzawa probably saw Suzuki as a ticket back home, but that didn't explain Matsuzawa and the suspect military yen transactions. Matsuzawa could e equally be Yasuda's frontman in Guangdong, or could be completely shut out from the business of glorified exile. Nothing but more questions. So if you do this, can you, you're going to help him out, but can you get uh, Saphir? Combat, carry out river operations. Here, manufacture more. It's fine, go and do that anyways. You see the question, a question of trust? The clock in Suzuki's silent off seemed to tick ever louder. A continuous cold beads of sweat rolling down his neck as he clears his mind of unnecessary thoughts. He holds a stack of paper within his hands, upon which contains all the evidence gathered on Yasuda. Bank that was collected. Suzuki knew it. It was undeniable. Something had been happening behind the curtains with the Yasuda Bank. The possibilities ranged from suspicious activities within the borders of Guangdong to a decree of corruption occurring in Tokyo itself. Suzuki felt like his hands trembling slightly. Whatever impact results from this, it will heavily affect him. Matsuzawa and Yasuda have been the most ardent and keen to back and support Suzuki in his actions during his senior as chief executive. Especially Matsuzawa, who has been personally vouched for support for him, and any failure scattered on his part will reflect upon him. So, so there is no absolute definitive evidence that Matsuzawa himself was involved in any ways, shape or form in this case, but if it is connected to Yasuda and Guangdong, it very much possibly involved him. Suzuki could very well place his faith in Matsuzawa, assuming he's innocent and ask for help in securing his relations, or he could assume that Matsuzawa was implicated, and directly accuse him. Either way, he had to make a choice. Suzuki took a deep breath and made his final decision. He has to be connected. We'll go that one. And we'll resettle the populace next. In a couple days, he falls ill. Okay, so cool. We actually have some of this stuff here. How long are we going to have these connections? If we lose a lot of guys, it really doesn't matter. A hub of a finance. Hong Kong is a city that has been drifting away from the Chinese mainland for nearly 120 years, but is under its own recent, most recent rulers that has transformed the most. The Japanese brought with them another language of people who now form nearly 30% of the city, and most importantly, the ruthless corporate mentality. It is here that black men in suit, black suited men in air-conditioned rooms decide the policies that keep countless millions enslaved for the brutal machine that supplies all the sphere. Here that fortunes are made on the scales unimaginable by the ordinary man. Here that vicious battles are fought in boardrooms masked by the sanitized language of the business world. From the dizzyingly tall glass skyscrapers that defy the eyes of their size, to the casual displays of the tremendous wealth that anyone can witness spending even a single night in the city, Hong Kong is not a place that passes easily from the mind, but of course, 
That is all the better to attract the right kind of investors, for those without the means to show that they belong in this world. All that is left is a better memory of what could have been, almost as a testament to the fate that lies for those with endless ambition and nothing else, Hong Kong. Also holds another much more sobering distinction. Perhaps the only city in the world where even the beggars on the streets still wear the tattered remains of the sleek suits they once hoped to rule the corporate world in. The city, however, is. No longer the sole domain of the corporate offices, as companies offer financial services of all kinds and banks realizing. The enormous potential of the city are slowly but surely becoming a part of its landscape. As the Pearl of the Orient evolves and specializes to become a financial hub to rival Tokyo, one thing remains clear, the underlying madness that hides itself behind the eyes of the wealthiest men in Asia is far from gone, and the furious desire for more only grows stronger. Either one controls their money or controls them, and the yes the question, Matsuzawa's response. Are you out of your mind? After all I've done for you, you come out with me with this? Eternal corruption with the prince, Prime Minister? Ah, that's absolute rubbish, ranted Matsuzawa as he slammed the pile of papers on the table. Suzuki quickly realizes the inconceivable blunder he has made and moves frantically to apologize, Mr. Matsuzawa. Please forgive me for the mistake I've made. I was being extremely rash and acted without proper judgment. I warn you, Suzuki, this instance made me reconsider my support for you and the Legislative Council. Matsuzawa's uh, fast paced spiel was interrupted by Suzuki. I strongly advise against that. After all, we've been instructed to collaborate by Tokyo. If we withdraw support from me, it'll damage both mine and your career. It is a benefit of none to of us. With this Matsuzawa relents, obviously looking unsatisfied. Fine, have it your way, Suzuki, but I'll have you know that I'll remember this indefinitely, and it'll sustain a relationship. Uh, Suzuki knows absolutely this will hurt his current position, but he has to contain the damage while he can, a political indiscretion, and I might redo really that one just in case. We'll see what happens. So how do you know when you get this one done? New names, old names. Uh, Chen thought the Japanese were very boring people. It was. The only explanation in his mind says why their names were places were so bland. Sheng Wan. Wan Chai. Even just like Repulse Bay were far more interesting and unique than, than West District, East District, and Green Beach Bay. The fact that the Japanese refused to accept defeat on the names of the people, or names of pe places, only made it worse. If you said a Chinese name, or even worse, a British name, they'd give you a look. When the Japanese changed all the street, street signs, giving directions with street names became far too much of a hassle to be worth it. Chen was old, and with age came wisdom, and also great stubbornness for people like him. The new names were always going to be a lost, lost cause, and the rest of his fellow countrymen were much the same, however. Chen even heard Zhujin businessmen stumble over the Japanese names, sometimes skip over them entirely and just use the old labels. The only name to find any success was Port Shorty, though that wasn't even the first name they tried to replace Old Victoria Harbor. The name was just because the Japanese were too impatient. They were trying to do it, what to do in 20 years that the British managed in a century. It just showed how fake it all was. Hong Kong was still gone, and the people in charge were different, but on the ground it's still all the same. At least it all gave us something to latch on to. Or sort of populous, and we might redo this just a little bit. See what happens. How are we supposed to do this in jungle environment? Hills, and the jungle's down here, so we actually might need to get get pushed back. I guess that's all the way up there, but that's pretty bad. Buying mountainous conditions. Oh, we're gonna get there, so we'll see. And I did it for the breakthroughs. Not all the companies are equally gifted. Some are burdened with limitations of manufacturing. Others experience hurdles in consumer re outreach. These issues of economic proportions impede the very streamlined capital flows. So, so does that one, Guangdong. To navigate around this misfortune, Shizuki has seen fit that he uses his position as chief executive to authorize an inspection of each company's proposed out product. And taking measures for rigorous trials, his plans to test and evaluate which item will reap the most profit, but means examining performance, consumer competence, and durability. Eventually, there's also come in, and Suzuki can begin to launch the next measure of it as a lucrative venture. The world turned upside down. Just as the east of Koshu's bustling streets, a quiet little village that stood undisturbed for centuries, unchanged even as the land beneath it changed from hands for the promised now state of Guangdong. Chun, the eldest son of the Li family, lies, lay wide awake at dawn. Reminiscing over the memories he had made here. The house had been, uh, he had lived in for his entire life was built long before he or his parents were even born. A rudimentary wooden foundation and ash gray walls standing firm in his 16 years of life. A barrage of hefty vehicles descended upon the village. The exterior is um, embellished and coarse, emitting an unending stream of pungent and opaque fumes. One of the men stepped forward with a megaphone and heavily accented Cantonese announced that the villagers would be vacated immediately. Do not resist yet. We would be provided with new residences. At this, the entire Lee family woke. The village owner would serve this village's need for his entire life. Stumbled upon to the men questioning why he hadn't been consulted before him. When the order from the chief executive Suzuki was presented, the elder did not relent, continued to press the issue. One of the men, growing increasingly frustrated, drew the pistol and slammed it into the elder's cheek, the screams of pain echoing throughout the village. Three consecutive bangs rang out from the front door of the house. Chun's younger brother, Hai, or Hei, hesitated before opening, revealing two young Kampai Tai officers who immediately herded the Li family, Chun, Hei, Wei, and their families outside, or parents outside, forcing them towards a several green olive trucks in the distance. Chun stole one last glance at the household where he grew up, realizing he'll never likely see it again. Bygone days. But on that really bright and happy note, we're going to end the episode there. If you enjoyed the video, though, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. See you tomorrow. See what else we can do with uh, Guangdong as we're very, very early in the very, very early stages of this campaign. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.